someone who's going to further that competition of ideas is our next speaker, um, who came on my dad's radar screen in 1987 uh, when he was on the uh, Foreign Relations Committee in the House, and they were talking about the, uh, how the Soviet Union's finances looked. Um, and he called a, a young economist to come testify, and uh, I think she must have been 10, 12 years old at the time. Um, <clears throat> but Judy Shelton uh, met my dad that day, and she uh, later, uh, that was 1987, and soon after that she gave him her new book, The Coming Soviet Crash, uh, which dad proceeded to take to uh, newly elected uh, President H.W. Bush, and uh, Dad and Judy had a very close relationship and, uh, and friendship um, throughout the years, and Dad depended on her uh, analysis and, and counsel, um, and I'm grateful that uh, she and Gil are friends of ours. Um, <clears throat> Judy has uh, recently written a book called Fixing the Dollar Now, Why U.S. Money Lost Its Integrity and How We Can uh, Restore It. Um, she also wrote A Guide to Sound Money, uh, a book that Dad mentioned at the Empower America conference in 1994 uh, that we saw earlier called Money Meltdown. Um, her international economics articles have been published in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Post, Financial Times, uh, the Nihon Kaize, man, I don't know how to say that, and El Economista. Um, Judy, we're thrilled to have you here. Please welcome Dr. Judy Shelton. Well, um, the presence of two giants hovers over this conference, one a politician, the other an academic. But that distinction is somewhat arbitrary. Jack Kemp was a scholar in his own right, someone who read John Maynard Keynes while riding on the bus to the next football game. And it was Robert Mundell's intellectual activism that powered the Reagan revolution and laid the groundwork for a common currency in Europe. So you cannot separate thought from action, at least not if you want to change the world. Jack Kemp and Robert Mundell did change the world. Jack was the driving force behind the tax and monetary policies that turned the lost decade of the 1970s into the economic boom that resuscitated world growth. He fully grasped the academic reasoning behind Bob Mundell's supply-side prescription for economic growth, a formula that boiled down to lower tax rates and a stable dollar. No wonder at a time when America is trying to reignite economic growth, while the world worries that trade tensions and protectionism could trigger the next global financial crisis, or that differential interest rate policies among the world's central banks will cause currencies to dramatically shift, choking off growth, potentially leading to regional defaults on dollar-denominated debt, no wonder now we find ourselves turning to the forward-looking ideas of Kemp and Mundell and asking what do we need to do at this point to turn things around? How do we get back on the path to economic growth, productive economic growth, the kind that actually raises living standards, the kind that leads to shared prosperity versus the kind fueled by low interest loans to large portfolio investors who bid up financial markets? What we need is real growth not speculative profit-taking from gaming the future path of interest rates and the next big currency swing. We need to raise economic confidence. We need a stable, dependable dollar. When Jack Camp and Robert Mundell hosted their 1983 International Monetary Conference right here in D.C., they had some powerful attendees, George Schultz, Secretary of State, Don Regan, Treasury Secretary, Henry Kissinger, Art Laffer, and has been mentioned, the actual proceedings from that conference were published in a book entitled A Monetary Agenda for World Growth. Jack Kemp summed up the purpose 
for the conference in the introductory chapter of that book. He wrote, there is broad support to the view that something is fundamentally wrong with the current international monetary system and that large unpredictable fluctuations of exchange rates have imposed severe costs on the economic system. The essential question they were asking at that conference was, should we continue with the floating rate system as the least objectionable solution, or should we restore a system of formally maintained exchange rates between the major currencies of the world? And that's the question we're asking here today. My own answer is that we have much to lose by continuing with the compromised and dysfunctional monetary arrangements we erroneously call freely floating rates. I believe we should restore a system of formally maintained exchange rates between the currencies of the world. And I say that having written a book called Money Meltdown, Restoring Order to the Global Currency System, as a senior research fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. And I say it as someone who was a visiting professor at a graduate business school in Mexico during the 1994 peso crash and for the years following, where I personally witnessed its devastating impact. And more recently, I say that from having served on the Trump transition team as international affairs advisor at the Treasury Department. When you are facing the real possibility of naming major trade partners as currency manipulators, it concentrates the mind. For one thing, we don't have a substantive working definition of currency manipulation. Does it mean that a government is deliberately intervening in foreign exchange markets to distort market forces? What if the government is deliberately intervening, persistently, but it's trying to hold its currency up? And let's say those three criteria the Treasury currently uses to identify offending countries in its semi-annual report, let's say by those criteria we could label China or Japan, or Mexico, or Germany, a currency manipulator. To what end? Now what happens? We apply tariffs? Those targeted countries will say, very indignantly, the reason our currencies are devaluing compared to the dollar is because your Federal Reserve is signaling higher future interest rates, which is true. And let's face it, how can you talk about currency manipulation and not talk about central banks and the impact of monetary policy decisions on exchange rate movements? It's disingenuous to pretend you can separate the Fed's influence over the supply of money and credit at home from the notion of dollar stability abroad. Now, there's an overarching theme in all this. Monetary integrity, it's something that Jack Kemp earnestly sought to achieve. He believed the United States as the world's leading free market economy, as issuer of the world's leading reserve currency, should provide global leadership toward achieving monetary integrity both domestically and internationally. Well, um, how can we do that? Where do we even begin, practically speaking? Let me offer a modest proposal. A modest proposal with a bold agenda, or as Jack would say, an audacious agenda. The overall goal would be twofold, to begin to reconnect U.S. monetary policy to the real economy so that productive, entrepreneurial, risk-taking, job-creating activity is supported, and to encourage America's trade partners to join us voluntarily in taking a small step toward considering new arrangements for a stable 
international exchange rate system to support global free trade and capital flows. Here's what I propose as something useful and constructive our Treasury Department could do and do quickly. We could offer a Treasury debt instrument that included a gold convertibility feature. Why gold? It doesn't have to be gold. But since central banks in over 100 countries already hold gold as part of their international reserves, it seems a good neutral reserve asset. And in my mind, a way to avoid political resentments. So let's imagine a US Treasury instrument that works like this. On the day of maturity, the holder of the Treasury bond would be entitled to receive back either the face value of the bond or a pre-specified amount of gold. Now, I'll say that again. The day the bond matures, the bondholder gets back either the face value on the bond or else a pre-specified amount of gold. It is their option. So, for example, let's say this bond, we'll call it a treasury trust bond, is going to mature in five years. And let's say the current price of gold is $1,260 per troy ounce. To keep things simple, let's say the face value of the bond is also $1,260. So on the maturity date, the holder of the Treasury Trust Bond can elect to receive either $1,260 or one ounce of gold, their choice on that date five years from now. How much would you pay for that Treasury debt instrument? Well, if you figure the dollar price of gold is going to remain stable over the next five years, so that the future price will be the same as today, $1,260, well, you wouldn't pay anything extra for the gold convertibility option. What you would be willing to pay would be the discounted value of receiving $1,260 five years from now, based on the current rate for a five-year Treasury note, which is about one and three quarters percent. So you would be willing to pay roughly $1,155 today to receive $1,260 back from the Treasury five years from now. That's the present value that equates to a 1.75 percent yield on your investment, which is the current interest rate on five-year treasuries. But let's say you are concerned about dollar stability in terms of gold. <coughs> you think it's pretty safe to lend money to the US government, but you'd be willing to pay something for insurance in terms of future purchasing power. You see gold as an acceptable monetary surrogate. You're thinking, what if U.S. economic growth proves disappointing and the Fed decides to go back into quantitative easing mode to supply more liquidity? The dollar would likely depreciate against gold. Maybe you think Congress will run bigger future budget deficits and you worry about the impact from that on the dollar. As a Treasury debt holder, you want to be compensated for any future loss in purchasing power due to dollar depreciation in terms of gold. By purchasing a Treasury trust bond, you've locked in the option to receive an ounce of gold at maturity five years from now instead of 1260 depreciated dollars. And that matters because it would cost more dollars now to buy that gold ounce. You have effectively protected yourself from the potential loss of dollar purchasing power in terms of gold over the life of the bond. Think of it as something quite similar to TIPS bonds, which the US government has been offering since 1997. Treasury inflation protected securities compensate the bondholder for any loss in purchasing power due to dollar depreciation in terms of the consumer price index. If inflation goes up over the life of a TIPS bond so that dollars are worth less, the bondholder is compensated 
with additional dollars so that they have the exact same purchasing power they had when they invested. With Treasury trust bonds, which I'm advocating, the bondholder is similarly protected. If the purchasing power of the dollar depreciates as measured in terms of gold, they will likewise be compensated by receiving the same amount of gold they could have purchased on the day they invested. It's pretty straightforward, actually. And maybe it's the kind of thing that grandparents buy for their grandkids. Maybe the Treasury initially offers it as a savings bond. It would be a novelty because for the first time since the end of Bretton Woods, it would establish a link between the US dollar and gold. It might be a good way to explain to the next generation what Thomas Jefferson meant when he wrote, if we determine that a dollar shall be our unit, we must then say with precision what a dollar is. Jefferson wrote that in 1784 in his notes on the establishment of a money unit for the United States. He had taken on the task of creating a common currency for a newly liberated nation comprised of 13 independent states. The dollar was defined with precision in the Coinage Act of 1792, and it was in terms of a specified amount of gold or silver. Now, it's true that legislation goes back some 225 years, but then again, so does the US Constitution. All right, let's think about what might happen today if the US Treasury were to issue a gold convertible debt obligation. How would other countries respond to that? Would they find it innocuous or somehow threatening? You know, it's interesting, Treasury Secretary James Baker gave a speech in 1987 in Washington at the joint annual meeting of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And in that speech, he announced that the United States would consider using a commodity price index that would include the price of gold as a tool for coordinating economic policies among the major industrial nations. A former deputy managing director of the IMF, William Dale, told a reporter at the time that Baker's proposal was likely just a tip of the hat to the gold bugs in the right wing of the Republican Party. Just an idea that Congressman Jack Kemp from New York was pushing as a way to stabilize exchange rates among currencies. Hmm. Secretary Baker is certainly a Republican, but he's never been a front man for Jack Kent. And I don't think anyone would suggest that Jim Baker is unsophisticated in his thinking about international finance and economics and the importance of currency stability. He just testified as much. I would say it was the IMF that dropped the ball. So now let's go back to this Treasury Trust Bond initiative. What if China immediately followed suit and issued their own version of a Chinese government debt instrument that could be redeemed at either its face value denominated in RMB or one ounce of gold five years from now? Markets would decide what to pay for that instrument with the market determined interest rate on five year Chinese government debt embedded into that price. And now think, US Treasury trust bonds and China's equivalently, equivalently structured government bonds would essentially be worth the same thing five years from now, one ounce of gold. Each one denominated in a sovereign currency but both convertible into the same monetary reserve asset at a specific price. That suggests an implicit future exchange rate between the two currencies based on $1,260 as the face amount on a treasury trust bond, and let's say at a seven to one ratio, 8,820 RMB on China's government bond. If both instruments sold at par, 
the implied future exchange rate could effectively become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, if the price of one nation's bond comes under market pressure, that's a clear sign the market anticipates one currency depreciating relative to the other in terms of the neutral reference point gold. That will send an important signal from investors about the growth prospects for that nation and about its fiscal and monetary policies. It could be a very useful tool for the Federal Reserve or the People's Bank of China, just as the yield on TIPS bonds today helps the Fed gauge aggregate expectations about future inflation Comparing the performance of these parallel instruments would reveal investor expectations about the relative stability of the dollar and the RMB in terms of a neutral reference point. It would provide a starting point for evaluating the trade impact of shifting currencies. We might even go so far as to suggest that in the future, Governments might agree to intervene to maintain the par value of their own sovereign debt instrument linked to gold rather than target a daily fixed exchange rate against a trade partner's currency as China does currently. Clearly, the European Central Bank or its individual member nations could do something similar. The IMF itself is the third largest gold holder in the world. It could facilitate the necessary arrangements for its members to offer such an instrument. In closing, let me note Jack Kemp's observation at that 1983 conference when he pointed out that any new system of formally maintained exchange rates among the world's currencies would need to choose a common reference point, an anchor. It could be a national currency like the US dollar, it could be a commodity like gold, or it could be a supranational invention like the IMF special drawing right, the SDR. Bob Mandel gave his own view. He said, choosing a dollar standard would be like imposing English as a world language. Choosing the SDR, he said, would be like trying to impose Esperanto on the world trading community. Mundell said that a gold standard would be closer to the mark, in his words, given the significant gold holdings of central banks. Quoting Mundell, if all countries agreed to convert their currencies into gold at an agreed price, gold could serve in lieu of the SDR, and the international gold standard would provide the world economy with a common currency, unquote. Let me just say that I believe U.S. leadership can and should play a strong role in helping to build a new stable international monetary system to serve an open global marketplace dedicated to free trade and genuine competition. And if the next Bretton Woods Conference takes place at Mar-a-Lago, great. <laughs> uh, let's hope it's not too far in the future. Thank you. So, do you, do, you, uh, do you mind taking a couple questions? Sure. Great. Um, so we do want to keep this quick, but uh, I know there's a lot of interest here. So, Steve? Take away. Yeah, Judy, uh, I just looked at the, the five-year forward contract on gold and the, and the implied interest rates 1.35%. And the five-year bond is 1.75. What do I do? Well, I think it, it's not really the interest rate on gold because we know that if the Fed is going to raise, then rationally a person wouldn't want to hold gold. They'd want to hold a currency where they can get a higher return on it. But what I'm thinking about in this instance is the store of value function of gold. So I don't really see that as... as um, as something that mitigates against the idea. I think there are some people who feel like um, they're quite sure that in the future um, gold might be worth more to them than the dollar, that it will take more dollars. And so 
it's, it's really like owning the Treasury security as the underlying security and having a call on the future price of gold, or you could look at it as having a put on the dollar value. And so I think it's, it's someone, if you don't think there's going to be any change, I mean, if we use like a Black-Scholes option pricing approach to look at the value of the security, you would say, what is, what is the value to me of having a call? And is it at the strike price? Or if I'm sure that the dollar is going to lose value in terms of gold, then I see it as an in-the-money call in the future. So it's really a matter of um, there will be some people who I think would pay a, a premium for that. And so you would see that, that instrument selling at greater than par. I can't imagine it ever selling at less, because there will always be people who say, I think the dollar will depreciate in terms of gold, and the value of owning the call is worth it to me. Therefore, I think it would be a very um, profitable, extremely low cost rate for the United States to borrow money. And all they have to do is perform better fiscally and monetarily than the aggregate market expects them to do, because then people will rather have the dollars in the future. It's only if they kind of blow it, I think, on either fiscal or monetary, that then the chances that the dollar will depreciate relative to gold go up. So, so what you're saying in this case, you, uh, you, you're, you're getting a free option, basically. No, I mean, I think people will pay a premium. It depends what it sells for. And what I like about it, it's market determined. It's market determined. But then it's up to the government I think, in the future to then start trying to target to have it sell at par, and that would be a sign that they intend to keep it stable so that, indeed, the face value is the same at maturity, which means they've accomplished dollar-gold convertibility at a fixed rate. You're, you're, you're a very good salesman. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go, next. <laughs> That's what it, I'd say you have, to, um, you have to argue every policy initiative you're trying to push. So I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> Aaron Fuchs, uh, general partner of Fertile Mind Capital. Um, first, uh, I would love to be the first purchaser of, uh, of those treasury There's trust funds. There's a sign. <laughs> he <laughs> might pay a premium. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she's right. But I do think that there needs to be a neutral um, arbiter of value that's separate from, from government. Uh, what I want to know is we've already come to the consensus that the idea of the dollar euro being uh, mandated to stay in a, a, sh a brief channel is is highly unlikely. How likely is it, given that you were on the Trump transition team, how likely is it that we'll see one of these Treasury trust bonds that I would like to buy? I'm making no predictions. <laughs> um, I won't comment on whether, you know, how, how serious how seriously the idea might be considered. Um, I, but I, I will say this with your comment about the dollar euro. Um, I live in um, Paris part time. And uh, what was mentioned by, by Ben about what could happen to the euro is a, is a real concern. Um, and, and of course, I mean, the, the euro's been a success story. It started with 11 countries. There's nine, 19 countries on it now. It's the world's second uh, largest, um, or second most popularly traded currency, second largest reserve currency. But the future is a little uncertain. The reason I'm sort of looking at China is because what we've seen is, um, beside that being a target of um, uh, President Trump, so we had to, frankly, we, we had to consider doing what he said he would do, which is to direct his Treasury Secretary to label China a currency manipulator on day one. We had to be prepared to do that. He still has that in his back pocket. We know there are geopolitical considerations today that are affecting that decision. But it does make you start thinking about what would be better <laughs> What might be better than doing that? I mean, what's the purpose of doing that? What do we want China to do? What do we want all our major trade partners to do? What, what's the monetary foundation we would like to, to see for the world? Because I take um, President Trump at his word. He, he believes in free trade. He believes in fair trade. I happen to agree it's unfair to change the terms of trade through sleight of hand by manipulating currencies. Now, you look at what, what China does, 
if it was just a mechanical thing and you were to say manipulating is when a government deliberately intervenes in a foreign exchange market, they do it every day, blatantly, openly. But in a way, that's stabilizing. That's you. I say if you're going to be intellectually honest, you can't just say it's manipulation when it you think it hurts you in the export world because actually it could hurt in terms of, let's say you want to invest in China. They're keeping it higher. You can't invest at the market rate, which should, it should be easier, cheaper for you to invest in China if you're a company that wants to. Um, for all we know, they're keeping it high so they can maximize their purchasing power in buying U.S. assets. So the point is, if you're distorting is distorting. And, and to call today's system freely floating, I, my office was not far from Milton Friedman's at the Hoover Institution. And we had quite a few discussions about these things. He would, he, in his famous debates with Bob Mundell, he said, I would rather have a gold standard than a dirty float. What we have today, five trillion daily turnover in currency markets by the top banks, governments intervening. If you had freely floating rates, no government would hold any reserves. They should be prohibited from holding reserves because it's none of their business. The free market's supposed to decide moment to moment what the exchange rate is. And yet we see so much money tied up in reserves and you see whole nations like Ukraine lose billions and billions trying to, trying to, to face off against speculators. It's a horrible system. Um, Kurt Schuller, I saw, we were at a conference together in um, Vienna in February 2014, and Jacques de la Rosière, the former managing director of the IMF, he said what we have today is, don't even call it a non-system, it's worse than that. It's an anti-system, and I agree with that. Judy, thank you very much.